Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time that we can now bring us your word. God, we ask that you prepare our minds, our hearts, quicken within us, Lord, that we can receive what you have for us this morning. I have nothing to say, but you do. So in spite of me, Lord, that you would teach us your ways. Grace in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. Amen. Isn't it amazing that you can have multiple eyewitnesses to a car wreck and they all see something different? And even accident investigators know that and realize it. They take that into account as they're recreating what happened in that traffic wreck. It's not an accident anymore, right? It's called a traffic wreck, a crash. And then you have those famous pictures you see online sometimes or in art books, of those optical illusions. And you look at it and they say, do you see a young woman? You know what I'm talking about? And you see the silhouette of a young woman? Or do you see an older woman? Which one do you see? The one I really like is in the middle of this picture, it looks like there's a chalice. There's a chalice right there, but no, if you look from a different perspective, it could be the silhouette of two people facing each other. It looks different. We see different things. John Lubbock once wrote, what we see depends mainly on what we look for. That makes sense, doesn't it? What we see is really what we're looking for. He goes on in that quote, and he says, In the same field, there's a farmer will notice the crops. A geologist will see the fossils. A botanist will see the flowers. Artists will see the color. A sportsman will see the game out there. Though when we all see, or look at the same thing, it does not all follow that we should see them. Interesting, right? See, in the Christian life, what God wants us to do is begin to see with his eyes. That's why it's called a Christian worldview. To see things as God sees them. To, to understand with God's heart, to, to feel, to have compassion, and have that same point of view. Jesus wants us to see as he sees, to feel as he feels, and respond as he would. That's what it means to be a child of God. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to conform our lives to the image of Jesus Christ, is it not? And the story we're going to read there, you already know, it's on your bulletin, and it's uh, in Mark uh, 9. But I want to begin this way by saying this, that everything that Jesus did and everything that he said was intentional. So as we read the scriptures and we follow the life of Jesus, as we listen to his words, look at his actions, every little detail we need to take into account, visualize it and see because he's setting that example for us. Because everything he did, everything he said was intentional. And why was that intentional? He's training the 12. See, he's on mission. He's now coordinating and developing his church. He's preparing these 12 now to carry on the ministry after his sacrifice for our sins. But not only that, his life is an example for what God expects his believers and how he expects them to live. So we need to look at that. And so as we look at this story, and I'm setting this up on purpose, is as we read through it, I want you to picture it in your mind. Try to be there and what's going on around there so we can understand what Jesus is trying to teach us. What is he showing us? What is the example that he's setting for us? Because in this story, there are two perspectives. And we need to look at it from both perspectives. One is the Jesus perspective. Again, Jesus. Well, what is he teaching us? How do we respond to people who are hurting, who, people who are in pain? How do we respond now in the world as we come here as the believing church and we worship and we fill up on God and, and we get pumped up now we go out to live for him how do we live on mission how would he have us live 
But then there's also the blind Bart perspective. We need to look at how he responds, how he acts, what he does. What can we learn from him as well? So we're going to jump right into it now in Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. Now it'll be on the screen here. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. And he said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, if you take notes in your Bibles, underline that. What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight. And he followed him on the way. See, as we unpack this and we visualize this, let's look at what Jesus is doing with this entourage, if you would. He's traveling between Jerusalem and Jericho. That's a common area to travel. And in fact, it's other stories in the Bible about traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho that it happened quite a bit. The man who fell among thieves and robbers was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And this is uh, sort of what it looked like. It was rocky, it's mountainous, it's desolate. That's the Jericho Road. Got another picture, there's some people walking on it right there. That, that, that's what it looked like. And so as they're traveling with this, notice as we read it, there was a great crowd, right? So we have the 12 most likely with him. And we know what they're doing if we look at those stories behind there. You have James and John saying, I want to sit at your right hand, Jesus. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And there's probably others asking him questions. And there's a great crowd because there are people now that are just seeking him, looking for miracles. But also there are those who are watching. What's he going to do now? And I'm sure there were some from the high court, the Jews, who were watching everything that he was doing. So there's a ton of people there. And they're talking, and there's chaos, and there's noise going on. That's important. Lots of things is happening. It's loud. It's rocky. I look where you're going. People are talking. They're asking him questions. They're talking among themselves. Noise. And then they begin to rebuke this guy, sitting off to the side there probably. And, and they begin to rebuke him. Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I'll be quiet. He ain't got time for you. This is Jesus. Don't you know that? Why would they do that? But we come back here to John 9, verses 1 to 2. This is another story. As he passed by, and again, as he saw, as he looked at this man, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So we already know what they think of people who are born blind. So he's cast away. Family probably wants nothing to do with him. Society says, you're a sinner, no way, get away. So he's probably been in that ditch. He has nobody, he has nothing but what people would throw to him and give to him. But here's the thing, let's, let's think about it this way. These are literally followers of Jesus who are saying this to him. These are followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus 
or saying, be quiet, he doesn't have enough time. So Jesus is going to take this moment to teach them about his mission and how we are to live. Bartimaeus, as I affectionately call him Bart, he's desperate. He's broken. He's at a place and in a condition that only God can do something about it. And that's a good place to be. You see, when we find ourselves in that place, that's when God can do his work of restoration. Because until we get to that point, we're going to turn to other avenues to try to find our healing or the answer to our problems. We're going to turn to everything that the world says to turn to, but until everything is taken away and there's no hope, until we find that it only can be found in Christ, nothing's going to change. It's only in Jesus. And so let's begin and look at the Jesus perspective. This is how Jesus wants us to respond. Remember these three things are so important. If we remember these as we live for him, we can do great work for the Lord. God's Holy Spirit can minister to people in and, and through us, and we can touch people's lives. We need to look. Look with God's eyes. Like I started off, sometimes we look and we see things from a, a certain perspective, or sometimes we look and we really don't see. But, but if we take the time to really look at what's going on around us, to see people who are in pain, to see what needs there are, God can work within our hearts to say, you know what, I want you to do something. And then once we look and we see, we need to feel. We need to have some kind of feeling in our hearts. Feel as God feels. See things as God sees. See people as the Lord would see them. And then I say compassion. Compassion means actually doing something. Now, I will have this disclaimer and say perhaps there are times God's going to say he doesn't want you to do anything. Pray for them. That's happened to me before. God, here, here's somebody here. Do you want me to do something? And no, okay, I keep moving. It's not all the time. That's why you have to discern in the spirit that feeling. You look and see, God, what would you have me do? Okay, let me respond now in faith and do something about this. Look, feel, compassion. It's not that hard. So how did, how did he look? First, he did this. Jesus stopped. He heard. How did we set this up again, and what was the visual? There's lots of noise going on, right? One of the things that bothers me and distracts me, even as I get older, is background noise. So if I'm in a room, and there's people talking, and things going on, this is happening, and you're trying to talk to me, I'm reading your lips at best. I can't hear. So, so if, if there's something going on where Jesus is now, there's lots of people talking to him, lots of people asking questions. But lots of things going on, good questions, bad questions, all that's happening. And he stops. That's intentional. Because he's discerning something in the spirit that's happening around him. I hear this. And he stops, and I even perceive and plug into this that perhaps he looked that way. He looked at him. See, if I'm up here teaching and preaching, I'm talking to you, and I stop, and I just kind of glance over at the door, some of you are going to go over and look at the door. What's he looking at? See, again, everything that Jesus does and says is intentional. So him stopping is causing us to look and see what he sees. Even that story that I read from uh, you know, John 9, he stopped and looked at the man, and that's when they began to ask the questions. Well, who sinned? Because he stopped and looked at him. Jesus is saying, do you hear what I hear? Do you see what I see? Here's this man in complete desperation, crying out. And then we have the feeling. How did he feel? See, God hears the cry of the desperate heart. God hears it. He will answer that. 
If you come to the place in your life, in any circumstance that you're facing, and you just cry out, God, help me, he hears. You can have that confidence. He knows and is aware of it. When we cry out, God, do you care? God, are you even here? God, where are you? In our faith, we can rest assured, yes, he's here. Yes, he hears. Yes, he's willing to do something about it. Peter tells us to cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. Cast them all. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary with heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Come to me. Will you come to me? Jesus said, I came to do the work of the Father. One of my favorite passages, and you're going to hear me say that a lot. <laughs> Every time we come to a passage, it's my favorite. But this speaks volumes. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. As Jesus preaches from Isaiah, this is what he reads. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. And recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is why Jesus came. Not just physical sight, but spiritual sight. To give us peace, to transform us from the inside out. And then compassion. He draws a man to him. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Again, hold on to this question if you underline it. We're going to come back to this. And all he says is simply, I, I want to receive my sight. And he gave him his sight. And you know what he did? He, he followed him along the way and he's healed. So the challenge at this point, and we're going to break this down even more. We're getting there. Is to look, to feel, and have compassion. Look, feel, and have compassion. Now let's go to the other perspective, the blind Bart perspective. Let's look at it from his viewpoint. He's desperate, he's broken, again he's in a condition and in a place where only God can do something. Only God can do it. Blessed are the poor in spirit for they will see God. Right? And he was that broken in spirit how did he know about Jesus? He's this beggar sitting on the side of the road. Well, again, let's put it into perspective. Let's understand what's going on here, right? What, what, what's happening? They're traveling, and this is a common road to travel. So he probably sat there a long time, maybe since he was a child. And he's hearing people walking and talking. Hey, did you see this Jesus dude? He's healing people, man. He says he's the Messiah. He, some say he's God in the flesh. He's hearing this over and over and over, and in his de desperation, he says, maybe this guy can help me. I'm broken, I'm desperate, only Jesus. See, whether intentionally or unintentionally, seeds were being planted, weren't they? People were hearing about this Jesus, or people were talking about it and he was hearing and he came to that place where he said, no doctor has been able to heal me. No medicine can do it. These people around here ain't doing it. I guess I'll try this Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. But again, what does he get from believers? Be quiet. He ain't got time for you. This is Jesus. Now, before we say, I would never say anything like that, let's think about that. How often do we make judgments about people? They look different than me. You see how they're dressed and tattoos and ears and nose piercings and, you know, all this stuff? And we make judgment calls about them. But if we look at the way Jesus looks at them, what does he see? Someone who's hurting, someone who's broken, someone who's crying out. 
someone who's lost. Walk into a restaurant and there's a homosexual couple sitting at a table. Even seen people say, don't put me near them. I don't, I'm, please put me over here. How often do we see that? We see people that look like hoodlums and criminals. Roll up the windows, lock the doors. I'm not saying that's not wise. Okay, but you get my point. But what does he do? He cries all the more. He reached to that desperation. He reached to that point where he knew only God could do something. And if Jesus is the Messiah, I'm going to cry out. Be quiet. No, he's going to cry louder. Nothing's going to silence him. He fights through to get to Jesus. He keeps moving toward Jesus. And Jesus hears him because he hears the cry of the desperate heart. See, there's times as us as believers, and we look at circumstances in our lives, whatever it may be, job issue, marriage issue, finance issue, you know, we live in life. Life happens to all of us. Perhaps it's a coworker that says, you really believe that Jesus, you're going to pray? You really think God's going to do something about that? No, th this is what you should do. Fight through it and cling to Jesus. New believers, people who accept Christ as their Lord and Savior and become new and they go back to their friends. Oh, man, really, dude? You're one of them Jesus freaks now? What? No, man, you don't believe that mess, do you? And they keep pulling away. No, keep fighting toward Jesus. There's voices all around us that speak to us. And we need to keep fighting for Jesus. And he is healed. He's healed. And what did he do? Jesus says, go away, you're healed. And he made the conscious choice and the decision to follow Jesus. Do you read all that in the story? Do we see all of that? He chose to follow Jesus. And what I love about that is what comes to mind is a story in John chapter 6, and, and Jesus is making it real as he's teaching. He's teaching the word of God, proclaiming the word of God, and some people don't want to hear it. And they start to follow him no more, the word says. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, do you guys want to go away too? What does Peter say? Where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where will we go? It takes now a conscious decision to choose to follow Jesus because there's nowhere else to go but to the Lord. Complete surrender to follow the Lord. Complete seeking and under, trying to seek to understand his word to become more like him. So two questions. Two questions here. First one is this. If you're standing before Jesus and he were to ask you, what do you want me to do for you? What are you going to say? See, let's make it more real. Real. Wherever two or more are gathered, there I am in your midst, says the Lord. And if we're the church, the worshiping community, where is Jesus? He's right here. And if believers are praying and we're connecting with the Lord, where is he at? With us. So when we pray, when we worship, when we do all these things that connect with the Lord, we're in his presence. So visualize standing in the presence of Jesus and him saying, what do you want me to do for you? And you can ask for anything. Why do we give up generic and general prayers? God bless my family. What does that mean? God, can you help me through this financial difficulty? No, no be more specific. Blind Bart was specific. I want my sight back. Please give me my sight. When I first uh, came here to interview a year and a half, almost two years ago, I met a man named Wolfgang. Some of you know Wolfgang. Ingrid, his wife, is here. And, and as everything was settling down and, 
and uh, had the vote to come here. I was getting ready to go back home to close out a ministry there. Everything I knew was on the East Coast in Florida primarily. And Wolfgang comes up to me and says, uh, how can I pray for you? And I said, uh, oh, you know, pray for my family, my kids, and, you know, pray for all this. He said, no, 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 no. If you know Wolfgang, it's no, no, no. How can I pray for you? He wanted something specific, you know. In that moment, I was able to grasp what was happening here. I had been this far west twice in my life before that time. Once was when I came out to have the formal interview. Four weeks later, this was the time I was here. Before that, Katy, Texas was the furthest west that I'd ever been. That's around Houston. And so I said, you know, I'm about to go back, close out a ministry in an area where I live most of my adult life. I'm about to uproot my children from all the friends they've had, their school and their routine. I'm about to put everything I own in the back of a moving truck and drive it across country. And with the same thing, we're going to travel together with the most viable things in this world, my family, my children. I've been a pastor a long time. I believe I'm a mature believer. I have faith. I know God is calling. I believe God is calling. I know God's going to provide. I know all that. But I can tell you, Wolfgang, I'm scared. And that's when he patted me on the cheek and he said, now I know how to pray for you. Now I know how to pray for you. You know, when I got here, I got to see him one more time. He was in the hospital before he went to be with the Lord. Walked into the hospital with him and I said, uh, hey, Wolfgang, it's Andy. You remember me? And Yes, of course I remember you. You know, if you know Wolfgang, that's how he would respond. And one of the things he said, I interpreted it. I'm not trying to read too much into it, but I understood, and perhaps he did too. He, he said, so you made it here. You got here. So yeah, I got here. You made it here. Specific prayers. Do you stand before Jesus and give those specific prayers? But then let's also equate it to, do you gather somebody that you can trust and believe in? Say, will you pray with me? I need you to pray with me about this specifically. Be vulnerable, especially among your friends. The next question is, does God hear you? Does God hear you? Who does God hear? Those who are broken, the cry of the heart. Now, the reason I had you under, underline this question is if you go back a little bit further, and this for the sake of time, we're not going to, but look at verses 35 to 36. That's James and John. James and John are going to say, can we sit at your right and, and to your left and all that conversation? You know what Jesus does? He brings them to him, and he says this, asks this to him. He said, can we ask you something, Rabbi? He says, what can I do for you? The same question. We don't have to go back to the Greek to interpret that. It's the same question in Greek and English. What can I do for you? And they ask out of their pride, not out of their brokenness. So Jesus is teaching them something. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So we need to lift ourselves up. Humble ourselves before the Lord. He will lift us up. He may not heal us physically. We may not get our sight back. He may not answer our prayers the, the way we wanted him to, but we will have eternal peace. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know what I'm talking about. He will give you peace and joy when we submit and surrender to him. When we turn everything over to him, we will go away with peace and joy in our hearts, no matter what's going on in our circumstances around us. I can testify, and I know some of you can testify to that too. I want to close this way. Two things I'm going to challenge you with this morning. One is to be intentional. Jesus was intentional. Be intentional. There's hurting people in here. There's hurting people out there. Do you see what God sees? Passage of Scripture. It's not on the screen. I'm going to read it to you. It's Matthew 9. Matthew 9, beginning in verse 35. 
And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease, every affliction. Now listen, let's picture it. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, I know how sometimes we look at this and I think it's all wrong. This is my perspective on this. I even asked my daughter this to see if I'm, I'm wrong. I said, I read this passage and I talked to my oldest daughter, uh, Victoria, who's 15. I said, what, is the, what do you think this means? And she said, we need more people to surrender to mission work. We need more people to go uh, surrender to, to be pastors. And I said, no. That's not what it means. You want to know what it means? What I feel it means and what it says to us. What it says is this. Jesus is going through, if you read back to the chapters, he's healing a blind man. He's healing a woman with blood issues. He's healing. He's doing the work. He's doing the ministry. And he finally comes and he looks. He says, look at all these people who, who, who are harassed. And in the King James Version, that word for harassed, that, that means vexed. Vexed means that they were internally and spiritually being tormented. And Jesus is looking at all these people. And he's looking to his church, to his disciples, and saying, yeah, I'm going out here doing it. I'm training you, but we need a mass of believers to do this. We need a mass of people to go out and see, to look, to feel, to have compassion, to do the work of the ministry. There's harvest out there that not one pastor can do, not one missionary can do. But you know what? If we are mobilized as believers and can be launched into the world, God could have his way. God could do great things. See, we are shepherds. They're sheep without a shepherd. We, we are the shepherd people. What does that mean? Draw them to us and go out to them and say, you know what? You see somebody at a restaurant. You see a friend. You, you go to wherever you go. And you say, you know what? I see that you seem down. You seem upset. Can I pray for you? Pray with them. And say, you know what, if you need to talk, I'll be there to talk with you. That's how, it, that's how it starts. You don't need to go to seminary to do that. To share what God has done with you. Look and have that feeling and go and do something about it. We have a great Embry-Riddle ministry. And there's students that are at Embry-Riddle. You know, I graduated from college a long time ago. But they're on the college campus. What if as they walked along campus, if they sat in the classroom, went out to the dining hall, and just looked, began to feel compassion and did something about it? You go to the gym. You know, I'm known now in the gym as Norm. You know Norm from Cherry, everyone walks in Norm? Because I talk to everybody, and I'm willing to pray with everyone. What if we did that? Be intentional. Next is be real. Be real with someone. But be real, especially with God. What do you want me to do for you? It's easy to hide and easy to fake it. We come into church, everything's good, God is good, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. And you know what? If that's the case, 52 weeks out of the year, I don't think you're being true and real. Be real with someone. Humble yourself this morning so God can lift you up. One of the things that bothers me in ministry as I, and later in life, not just here, is that no one comes up to the altar. So we see the altar is for somebody to get saved. That's true. If you don't know Jesus, Lord and Savior, come up, we'll talk to you, we'll pray with you. We'll, we'll talk about that. But you know, coming up is humbling ourselves, coming before the Lord and saying, God, I need help. I, I need to pour out some stuff to you. Whether you do it alone or someone comes up to pray with you, the Spirit will move. So we're going to have a mom, uh, moment of invitation. We're going to turn to the Lord. I'm going to pray. And this is going to be your time to be real with God. If you come up, bring somebody with you. Or, or ask somebody to come up and pray with you. But do your business with the Lord. What do you want me to do for you? Let's go to the Lord prayer. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful morning, this time together. Thank you for the example 
blind Bartimaeus and the example that you set for us. God, help us to be intentional as we live for you, but also, Lord, to be real before you and before others. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.